really, they're all really great questions. Um, so I'm doing my best to answer them. But when I when I typed up the list and all my my answers, um, I came out with 15 pages. Um, so um, I don't know if I'll have enough time to do all. I mean, I'm, I'm open to do it, but I don't know if y'all will have to do the resilience. If those those seat might seat might be a little hard. Um, if I were to go through all these. So what I'm going to try to do is um, I will give a quick answer to the question. And if the answer is not satisfactory, like if you want, if you need more details, or if you don't think the, the, the answer is correct or whatever, um, just raise your hand, and we'll go. We can explore a little more into it. But it is okay. Um, I'll give the quick answer, and if, if that's okay, then I will just go on to the next question. And if we go through all the questions um, with the quick answers, then we can go back and, and I can just call in all that and, and answer the specific questions that you'll have about it. If that sounds okay. expression of an interior prayer, right? So when you pray, you don't just think, you actually say words, or you, you might even kneel down and, and like um, fold your hands in prayer. You do physical actions to help out the interior prayer, um, because we're, we're not just souls, we're also bodies, and those, you know, those two work together. When you're wearing a scapular, that's an external expression of your interior prayer, specifically the prayer of hope for salvation. Right? If, you, if you are always praying, Lord, let me be saved, that's a great way to um, get yourself to heaven. Kind of like what Father, what Father was um, saying earlier. If you're always praying, you're always hoping for heaven, then you are on the right line. So that scapular is an external expression of, of that prayer. And as long as you don't um, let go of that prayer, as long as you like don't change your mind and say, oh, I don't want to go to heaven anymore, or, or something like that, um, that prayer is still active. Um, as, and as long as you're wearing the scapular, in some ways that prayer is still active. If you, if you start thinking, well, wait, nah, the scapular can't really get me to heaven, and you start doubting it, or maybe even take it off, in some ways you're ending the prayer because you're ending the external expression of that prayer. But as long as you leave it on, and as long as you don't change your mind, you're kind of implicitly always praying. Now, you ask about sin. If you sin, you have said, I don't want to go to heaven anymore. I want to do what I think is best. I want, to think, I want to do what I think will make me happy. So anytime you sin, you're implicitly letting go of that prayer. And so 
if you die um, in, with, in, a mortal, in a state of mortal sin, even if you're wearing the scapular, um, that's not enough to get to heaven. Okay. Um, something similar about St. Philomena, um, somebody asked about the St. Philomena cord, and the duty, uh, how is the St. Philomena cord supposed to be worn? Kind of the same thing. Um, you're supposed to wear it um, as a prayer. And you get the benefit of, of the intersection of St. Philomena, specifically the virtues of purity and courage, uh, because she was a chaste virgin throughout her whole life, and she was a martyr. She died um, proclaiming Christ and his truth. Um, okay. All right. Um, does, if you don't pray every day, does that break the relationship with God? Okay. Um, that's a good question. Christ tells us we need to pray always. Okay, so that's kind of an indication. Yeah, it's kind of important to pray. Um, and if you stop praying, there, there might be something serious going on. Um, I, would, I would recommend this. The best prayer is love of God, right? And wanting to be with Him, wanting to live your life with Him, um, which comes to its fruition in heaven. Okay, so wanting to go to heaven and wanting to live as much of heaven on earth um, and the various particular things that, in, that are involved with that is kind of the best prayer. Okay? Or in other words, you can just say, um, love of God is the best prayer. Okay. Now, if you ever do anything, so, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll say this first. As long as you decide that, um, even if you're not speaking the words, your will is all, is, is, that decision is always there. Mm -hmm. And as long as that decision is there, you're kind of implicitly praying, even if you're not speaking the words. Okay, it's kind of like the scapula, that, that prayer continues. Um, as long as that decision hasn't, um, hasn't gone away. Um, but, like earlier, like I said earlier, if you do something physically that negates that prayer, then the prayer goes away, right? So actions speak louder than words. So if you sin, or if you do anything that, that says to God, look, I don't love you as much as I should, or I don't really want to go to heaven, um, you've negated that prayer, which means you should, you should pray again. You should negate that negation. <laughs> Uh, and go back to, to get back in a good, uh, good state. Um, so I would say you should pray at least as many times as you commit sin or as you commit a fault. Um, which might be, I mean, I'm looking at my own life, um, which might be many times, you know, all those little mistakes you made during the day, whatever, all those venial sins. Um, renew your act of prayer every time you fall. And then, but it's not just about going back, getting back to God. You also want to have a good relationship with God. You want to grow and, and appreciate God and see how awesome He is. Um, and so, on top of those, you know, bare minimum times, you should you should add extra prayers. And that doesn't mean like you should always be, um, you know, carrying your rosary around and always be saying a rosary. And, um, and like, you know, you're trying to talk with someone. They're, they're, while they're speaking, you just turn to say the rosary. And then, whenever you're supposed to talk, you put okay, you, you talk and then you go back to the rosary. You know, that would be kind of weird. Um, but um, you should you should do as much as you can to grow in that relationship and and coordinate your life so that even your physical actions, even the communication with people, can be a prayer, where you because you do it out of love for God, um, and so that you, you constantly are building on that relationship and getting better. Okay. Um, that's kind of a big question. Uh, this is another big question, an important question. Is there a way to be forgiven mortal sins without going to confession? Um, what do you think? What do you think the answer to that question? Anyone? What do you think? What would you say? No? Yeah, that seems like the right answer, right? Um, otherwise, why would you need to go to confession? You need to get your sins forgiven without going. Actually, there is a way to have your sins forgiven, even without going to confession. I was very surprised when I heard this uh, the first time. Um, but it's not very easy to do. It's a very particular thing you need to do. You need to make an act of perfect contrition. An act of perfect contrition. Now, an act of contrition is, um, actually, I, I, I have a quote from the Council of Trent. Contrition is a hearty sorrow and detestation for past sin, together with a firm resolution to sin no more. 
If you look back at your sin that you committed and you regret having done it, and you resolve not to do it again in the future. Okay, that's just regular contrition. There's two kinds of contrition. There's imperfect contrition. And that is when you have contrition um, because of, you love yourself, because of some benefit to you. Um, so, for instance, if you have if you're sorry for your sins and you don't want to sin again because you are afraid of going to hell, okay, that's because some bad thing's going to happen to you, or because you really want to go to heaven, right? Because of some reward you want. Okay, that's imperfect contrition, which is still great. And if you have imperfect contrition, that's enough to go to confession and have your sins removed. Okay, um, but if you have but perfect contrition. The better one is when you have a hearty sorrow for past sins and you resolve not to sin in the future because you love God, because you love what He did for you, and you know and you know that He deserves um, your, your respect and your worship and your love. Um, so, so can you see how the focus is more on Him and not on yourself? If you're sorry for your sins for His sake, then that's an act of perfect contrition. Okay, and. Um, the church teaches if you if you do that, then and you resolve to get to confession as soon as possible, then at that moment you are put back into a state of grace. And um, if you die, you you won't be in danger of hell, um, which is you know really great to know, <laughs> right? Anytime you commit a sin, you realize oh I've committed a mortal sin. Make an act of contrition. Have, if you have, have you all memorized the act of contrition for the for the sacrament. Yeah. So make and say that act of contrition, and do it because God loves you so much, and that and because you want to return love to Him. As soon as you make that act, act of that, that mortal sin, and if you do it, if you make an act of perfect, perfect contrition right then and there, you will be restored back to grace. Um, and if you die before you, you're able to get this confession, then you'll be in, in pretty good shape. You'll, you'll probably have to spend. Uh, some time in prayer to um, but if you don't, but but there's a couple of, of um, asterisks there. Um, first of all, if you if you if you make an act of perfect contrition after committing mortal sin, you're still not allowed to go to confession to um, to go to holy communion. You can't receive the Eucharist um, until you've gone to confession and confessed the mortal sin. And, I, and I'm talking about moral sins here. If you commit a venial sin, you don't actually know his grace in your soul. You can just reduce the but it's still coming out. Um, but if you, if you committed a mortal sin, you make an act of per perfect contrition, you have to go to confession before you receive the Lord's Um Secondly, um, I wouldn't count too much on your ability to uh, make an act, act of perfect contrition when you're in a state of sin. Because you've just sinned, which means you've just done an action that says, I love myself more than God. Um, and that it's really hard to do really to do good actions in the state of sin. So, so God might give you the grace to make an act of perfect contrition right then and there. And hopefully he does. Um, but um, you should always get to confession as soon as you can after committing more of something. Um, any any And that's part of the act of your first nutrition. Yeah. It's implied that you're going to get to confession. Okay. When confessing our sins to the priest, what happens if we forget any mortal sins we committed? Is there a way to make up for it? Okay. In order to have a valid confession, you need to confess every mortal sin that you've committed. Both um, every kind of mortal sin and the number of times you've committed that mortal sin since your, your last previous your last good confession. Okay. Now, God does not um, expect you to, to do the impossible. Okay. So if in that <coughs> moment in the confessional you're thinking and, and, and you made a, a, an examination of conscience before and you try to remember as many sins you can, you go into the confessional and you said all the sins that all the mortal sins um, in species and in kind and, and in number that you can remember. 
You've done enough. Because God can't expect you to, to um, say those sins that you honestly can't remember, the ones you can't recall in that moment. Okay? If you say all the ones you know that you can remember, um, then that is sufficient matter for the priest to give you absolution. Okay? Now, if later on, um, after he gives you absolution, um, you remember when you, another mortal sin you should have confessed, but you, you just forgot. You are still forgiven of that sin because the previous confession has covered all the ones that, because you said all the ones you can remember. But if you remember one afterwards, you should bring it up in, your, in the next confession so that even that one is covered. And one reason I've heard for that, um, which is kind of interesting, is um, all the unconfessed sins that you have when you die um, are kind of free game for the devil. So that when, at, when you're being judged, the devil can come up to you and say, hey, this person did this. Um, but the sins that you commit, that you confess in confession, he, he can't even touch. He, he has no rights over it. He can't accuse you of those at, after your death. Um, so that's just one reason why it's good, even though you've been forgiven the sins that you couldn't remember in confession, it's still a good idea to bring them up in your, in your next confession. Um, how do indulgences work? If you if you got one indulgence for yourself, do you um, skip purgatory automatically? It seems too easy. Um, and the quick answer I'll give to this is uh, there's nothing wrong if it's too easy. All of salvation and actually everything you have and are is a complete gift of God. You didn't deserve your life, you didn't deserve the grace that you were given, the salvation that you have in your soul right now. Um, all of that was just a free gift from God. Um, which means it's the easiest, it was the easiest sin in the world. So it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be that problematic if um, an indulgence is too easy. Um, God wants us to, to be with him in heaven. And he wants us to be saved. Um, in fact, there's one indulgence that is mind-boggling. I was very surprised when I heard it. it. It's an indulgence granted at the moment of death. And um, all you need to have done is to, during your lifetime, said some prayers regularly. Right? Remember Father was talking about praying, keeping your prayer life? Um, if you have said some prayers regularly, um, and you are disposed, you're ready to be to, to receive God's grace, then the, the, the church grants you an indulgence right at the moment of death. Right? That's, and that's like, yeah, that, that, that one's very, um, very, um, yeah, it's just mind-boggling. <laughs> that, that the church is that free in giving out grace. Okay? And it should move you to love the church and love God because they're so, they're so generous. They, they just want you to have all these good things. Um, they, 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 those are ways of drawing you to um, love, love God. Don't just think of them like as an exchange, like I give God these prayers and gives me back these graces. Um, but look at the person who's giving you those gifts and, and appreciate them. Okay. Um, and I can say more about the, the five requirements for indulgences and things. Okay, very good. Um, why does prayer become more intense during Lent? Um, this is this is a kind of cool because today's re reading and the Office of Reading so that we, we pray this one. Um, we we actually we prayed um, the Office of Saint Christopher and his companions, um, but the regular day, if it wasn't the feast day today, we would have read. Um, the answer to this question, St. Augustine um, writes the answer to this question. So I'm just going to read that real quick. Um, St. Augustine says, Because there are these two periods of time, the one that now is, beset with trials and troubles of this life, and the other yet to come, a life of everlasting serenity and joy, we are given two liturgical seasons, one before Easter and the other after. The season before Easter signifies the troubles and that season, of course, is Lent. 
um, the season before Easter signifies the troubles in which we will live here and now, while the time after Easter, which we're the season we're in now, um, which we are celebrating at present, signifies the happiness that will be ours in the future. What we commemorate before Easter is what we experience in this life. What we celebrate after Easter points to something we do not yet, yet possess. That is why we keep the first season of fasting and prayer. But now the fast is over, and we devote the present season to praise, such is the meaning of the Alleluia we sing. Both these periods are represented and demonstrated for us in Christ our head. The Lord's passion depicts for us our present life of trial. It shows how much we must suffer and be afflicted and finally die. The Lord's resurrection and glorification shows us the life that will be given to us in the future. I couldn't pass up that opportunity to just give the answer to you that gave to us. Does that make sense? Um, what makes a day a holy day of obligation? Why are some days, um, why aren't some days holy days of obligation, like Ash Wednesday? Um, so God has decreed, were you all familiar with the Ten Commandments earlier? Is this all? No? Oh, it was? It was? Yeah. Oh, okay. It just looked like maybe the beginning or something. Okay. Who knows the... Uh, oh, it's right here. The third commandment. Um, so the third commandment tells us, commands us, to set aside certain times every week dedicated to the worship of God. All day Sunday, um, God commands us to worship Him. Okay, which we do by going to Mass, right? And by enjoying the, the, the images of His life in our family, right? It's Father and Son, so we also enjoy our family and worship God in communion with our family um, because the family is a, is a, a representation of those familiar with where worship is. So he says, yeah, dedicate those times to, um, to worship with Him. That's just every week. Now, the church has, has decided throughout the year we're going to have to set aside special times to, for the worship of God. And, and the church dedicates certain seasons, right, like Lent and Easter. And those seasons are dedicated for the sake of focusing on certain points in time and times in, in Christ's life. Because he wants us to imitate him and to pay more attention to um, how he lived. And it's so hard, it's too hard to, to think about all of him all at once. So we, we, we break them up into chunks, certain parts of his life into chunks. And we focus on those, right? So when he was 40 days in the desert, um, with fasting and prayer and enduring temptations, we uh, we live out that those forty days in Lent, okay. And then those forty days or fifty days um, between the resurrection and the um, and Pentecost that he lived out, we we are living out right now, all right. And so we so we're paying special attention to those particular times so that we can imitate him better. Well, the church throughout the year has specified these certain days that are more important than others. Um, and some of them are so important that, they have, that the church obliges us to go and worship God in them because they're just so important. Um, who knows one of them? Or who knows it? 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 Who knows While you're thinking, I'll ask you this. Is Easter Sunday a holy day of obligation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, sort of. It's only it, it's not explicitly a holy day of obligation, except for the fact that it's Sunday, which so God made it a holy day of obligation, but it wasn't one that the church had to establish. Um, those are all the other holy days of obligations kind of fall outside the Sunday obligation because they're established by the church. Does anyone remember that? Palm Sunday, I mean, that, that falls into the Sunday. <laughs> Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also um, the eighth day after Christmas. Do you remember what Jesus celebrated? Uh, um, or, well, not quite. Not quite. <coughs> We celebrate the birth of Christ on Christmas. Who, who else is important for the birth of Christ? 
There, yeah, yeah. Her mother of God. Her mother of God. On um, on New Year's Day. Okay. How does the Catholic faith and the Christian faith differ? Um, this is kind of a trick question because there is because all Catholics are Christian. So in some sense, I can honestly say uh, there is no difference between the Catholic faith and the Christian faith. Okay. But sometimes people use the word Christian to mean um, a follower of Christ who's not a Catholic, say like a Protestant or an Evangelical. Um, and how do they differ? Well, the major difference that is an easy one to go to <coughs> is whether they follow the Pope or not. Whether they acknowledge that the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth. Okay? And that he's the head of Christ's church on earth. The visible head. So just as Christ rules his church from heaven, the Pope rules it on earth. He's like, he's the, the, yeah, the representative, representative or vicar of Christ on earth. So, uh, an easy way to tell is um, whether they acknowledge the Pope as the, as the head of Christ's church on earth. Um, and that kind of makes sense, because the church on earth, what well, Christ <coughs> teaches the truth, and um, he didn't want that truth to just be forgotten, so he established the church to guard that truth, along with the sacraments and, and all the, the grace. Um, but the church was established um, to, to preserve the truth and to pass it on from generation to generation. And the church and the, the Pope is the head of the church on earth. So he's um, guarding all the truth that um, the Catholic faith uh, holds. And so he's kind of like, you got him, you got it all. So that's that that's what I would say in answer to that question. Is that what you're saying? Um, now, what happens, this is great, what happens when the Pope strays from God's truth, right? So we think, well, he's in charge. He's got to protect the church and preserve it all. Um, what happens when he strays from the truth? Well, there's a distinction here. There, and, and, and this is, of course, asking about people and fallibility. When, how can, the, how can the, the Pope be wrong, but also be infallible? Um, and the answer to that is, um, he's not infallible with regard to everything he says. Right? So you can't, so people often say, you can't go to, a, go to him and ask him, what, what are the winning lottery numbers? Right? And he'll you know, keep the up to date in mind. That, that's, not how, that's not what his infallibility extends to. There are actually there are very specific um, conditions that have to be met in order for the church to, um, or in order for, for the Pope to be uh, speaking infallibly, um, which I can go over, but uh, if you want to hear about. But more, in answer to the question, Anytime the Pope strays from the truth, he's giving his own opinion, and he's not meeting those conditions for speaking in Calvin, right? Which are which are very particular. So unless he's like you know saying specifically, pretty much I'm speaking in Calvin right now, or I'm trying to speak in Calvin right now, um, he's just he's kind of an ordinary person, like like you and I, and, and able to make mistakes, able to make judgment, bad judgment calls, and things like that. Um, so. If the, if the Pope happens to say something that goes against Catholic teaching, just you know, in an interview or something like that, we don't have to worry about that um, because he's not teaching in his, in his um, full authority at those moments. Okay. Now, at the same time, there's a canon that I, I, I uh, learned about this year that was surprising. Um, and the canon essentially says um, you need to respect the opinions of bishops. Okay, actually, I'll just read it. Conscious of their own responsibility, the Christian faithful are bound to follow with Christian obedience those things which the sacred pastors, inasmuch as they represent Christ, declare as teachers of the faith or establish as rulers of the church. So whenever a, um, whenever a pastor, it says, a priest or a bishop or someone with authority, um, whenever they declare, teach something as part of the faith and... Um, make a judgment call as a ruler of the church, that might be wrong. They might be making a mistake in doing that. But that doesn't mean that you can just discount it and say, oh, I'm just going to ignore what they said. No, you really need to sit, take it seriously. And if there's no harm done to you um, in, in maybe a judgment call that they make, then you should, you should um, try to follow it. Okay? Even if you think it's, it's stupid or whatever. 
you should you should take take it seriously. Now, if it if it makes if it if it leads you into sin, then you should definitely not do it. Or if it makes you think something that's false, then you should you shouldn't hold to it. Um, but you should give them respect. You should at least consider. Well, um, can I can I actually do what they're telling me to do? Um, okay. If other beliefs have some truths, how do we decipher um, what's true? Um, and I'm thinking, like, this is a, I, I think I'm thinking this is a question of how do we know that the Catholic Church teaches the truth um, if Protestant churches also teach the truth? How do we know that you know what's what? Um, and there you just start all the way, all the way from the beginning. Christ, our God, is truth. Okay? In St. John's Gospel, he says, I am truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, Christ came to earth to teach us the fullness of truth. And um, he, he told his apostles, I have taught you everything. Um, he, so he gave all that truth to his apostles, and he established the church, like I said earlier, to, to preserve that truth. And the church has, has had has lived on for 2,000 years in an unbroken line, preserving that truth. Seeing more details here and there, but essentially the, the core of the truth is all the same. Okay. So if there's something regarding faith or morals, something, something regarding sacred re revelation, um, you can always trust the Catholic Church. Um, whatever they say is true, but especially what, it, what, they have, what they have taught down the centuries. Okay, that's called ordinary magisterium. If, if all of the bishops from the time of Christ up to this time have all have said the same thing, then you know that's the teaching of the truth of the, of the church. When the, the Pope speaks infallibly, um, so the, the, there were a couple times. One time, he infallibly declared that Mary was uh, immaculately conceived. That was an example when he when he, he met the conditions and and said yes. Um, this is you can hold to this. This is absolutely true. There's no doubt about it. Um, that's called extraordinary magisterium, an extraordinary teaching of the magisterium. Okay, those are that's still true, but it's extraordinary. It's not the ordinary way of doing it. The ordinary way is to just have the constant teaching over the over the years. Okay, um, so with regard to faith and morals, you know that that's always going to be true. If it's not regarding faith and morals, like um, whether um, like one question that is coming up soon. Um, well, um, whether the Big Bang happened. Um, that's not something that pertains to Revelation. It's not something that um, is about God directly. Um, it's not about faith or morals. It's about science in some ways. Um, and the church allows us to have um, different opinions on, on those sorts of things. Um, and so uh, with regard to, to Revelation, um, you trust the church. With regard to other things, it's just hard. You just gotta do the dirty work and um, read them out things and see what the truth is. Um, now, um, why are the three kings important around the time of Jesus' birth? Um, first, the, the Bible doesn't actually say there are three. Um, they're, they're, they're said to be three because there are three gifts that were given. Um, and the, as far as I know, they're only called Magi, so this, you know, it's not exactly certain that they're kings. Some people call them wise men. Anyway, those are the gifts. Um, they're important because it signifies the belief of the Gentiles. So, the, so God was preparing his people um, ever since Abraham um, to receive his, his special revelation. But once Jesus came and made that revelation of himself, um, that, that, was supposed to, that was destined to be um, spread out to the entire world. And that, was, that, that spreading out of the truth to all the nations, to include all the nations, was signified by the coming of three king, of the kings, of, of the Magi, <laughs> um, from, from the east, um, who, legend has it, they had, um, they had um, received certain special uh, revelations, certain special prophecies that um, Christ was going to come, even though they didn't have the revelation of the Old Testament. They, they were given special privileges to, um, to hear about it. And so they knew, okay, when I see this star, there's something strange going to happen. 
I'm going to go follow follow it, and they wound up in Bethlehem and, and, and found Christ and worshipped him. So to signify um, the inclusion of all nations in Christ's mission is what I would say. But there's probably a whole lot more to say about St. Jude or any part of the Bible. Um, okay, what is the importance of apologetics? Um, Apologetics is is, um, is using knowledge to get people to see the truth. That would be one way to define it, to see the truth of, about the Catholic faith. Okay. Um, now, although it's true, or maybe I'll ask you, if you're not in the Catholic Church, can you be saved? Can you be saved if you're not in the Catholic Church? If you, if you practice another religion? Right? Or maybe you can, even if you existed before the Catholic Church, all the people in the Old Testament, or um, people right now who are living far to, far to the land who haven't heard of the Catholic Church, is it possible for them to be saved? What do you think? It's hard. It's a hard question. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer. Yes, there's all kinds of different beliefs, right? So how would you know whether you whether you have the right beliefs or not? That's a great answer. Um, in fact, they can be saved even though they aren't explicitly part of the Catholic Church. They can be saved in a different religion, but they're not saved through their different religion. Everyone who is ever saved is saved because of, the, of Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. They don't know that they're receiving all the grace that they need to be saved, but if they do receive that grace, it comes from the Catholic Church. Well, how about when you're Catholic and you walk away from the Catholic Church? Yeah. Can you be saved? So that's a, that's a, that's, um, that's a complication, yeah. right? So those people who uh, never heard of Catholic faith, um, but are, do, are living um, in a way that that they're trying to seek God, and they're doing everything that they can that they know is good, um, and they're honestly seeking heaven. Um, those people are in a great shape. You know, they they still uh, run the risk of, of falling to, to errors, um, but they're they're as far as we can tell, they're on the right track. If there are people who explicitly deny the truth of the Catholic faith, then they're in a bad spot um, because. The other people didn't know, but these people did know, mm -hmm. and now they reject it. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And so they're, they're in peril. Yeah. So apologetics is really important because it helps people to come into the Catholic faith, to see the truth of the Catholic faith, so that they're not um, in danger of losing salvation. But um, apologetics isn't everything, right? There's a lot of emphasis on apologetics right now in the church, which is great. We need it. We need it help people as much as we can to get into the church. But once they're in the church, um, it's not like, like, you know, now you're in the church and you're done. Um, apologetics isn't everything. Um, there's, some, um, there's some knowledge that is just worth knowing for its own sake, not, worth, not just for the sake of getting people into the church. Um, that knowledge, like um, studying God's nature, studying the Holy Trinity, um, and actually what we're doing right now, answering particular questions that are just kind of interesting about the faith, right? I'm not doing this so that y'all will enter the church. <laughs> y'all are already here. Um, but it's just kind of worth, it's kind of neat to, to think about these things. It's enjoyable to contemplate our faith and see how reasonable it is. Um, and so apologetics um, gets you there, but once you're there, you should study your catechism and um, theology. Because that's, that's the stuff that's like, that's just really worth knowing. Uh, that's what I was doing at college, um, what I was doing here uh, at the seminary. Um, and I don't, it, hopefully you all have tasted it, and if you haven't, I can assure you, it's, it's wonderful. It's very much worth it. Um, that has been, when the Father asked, um, think of the happiest moment in your life, um, I was brought back to the time, one of the times I was thinking of this, a time when something just clicked in my mind, and, and, something, and something about God just made sense, and, it, it, and like the whole world just changed. So that was really nice. Anyway, um, okay. Um, 
Are Catholics supposed to reject theories like the Big Bang Theory? Um, interestingly enough, um, the, the Big Bang Theory was actually um, proposed by a Jesuit priest. He came up with that. Um, and he was so excited that with this theory, um, because it explained you know, the expansion of the universe and why there was redshift and all that. He was so, so excited about it that he went to the Pope and explained it to him. And the Pope was so excited about it that he said that you know, he, he um, approved it. He didn't say that it was official church teaching, but he really liked it. And he said, well, maybe, maybe that, that first moment of the Big Bang, maybe that was the moment of creation. Um, and the Jesuit priest you know, said, well, I don't know, but um, I'll, take, I'll take your, I'll take your that opinion. Um, so the Big Bang Theory is actually a really Catholic position. Now, it doesn't seem like a Catholic position nowadays because people use the Big Bang Theory to say, oh, we don't need God. Um, the universe just came to existence on its own. Um, we don't need a, a creator to, to hold it there. Um, but that's, that's absurd. You can't have nothing and then have something come from nothing. That's just, that's impossible. Um, if, if, well, I guess there's two possibilities. Either there was nothing before the Big Bang and then something just popped into existence Somehow, um, which is absurd, you need a positive cause as to why it popped into existence. Or, before the Big Bang, there was something, right? The universe just in a different state. Um, and then, um, then it, the Pope would have been wrong on that opinion. Um, but uh, it, would just be, it would just be, yeah, kind of the same thing. Um, the, the universe would just have a different, in a different state now than it was before. Um, sorry, no, I can't talk. Um, yeah. What about like evolution? Evolution, yes. Um, so there are actually some some theologians um, who have argued that evolution is actually uh, the better theory, um, and uh, that it, that is to say, it's completely compatible with Catholic faith. As long as you, you don't say, as long as you don't hold a theory that rejects God and his truth, right? So if you say something like, um, human beings are just apes, there's no real difference between a monkey and, and a human being, that would be um, condemned by the church. You have to actually say that there were two people at the beginning, Adam and Eve, who, from whom all the human race came, right? Um, the, the first two human beings. Um, if you, so if you have a, a theory of evolution that upholds all of the revealed truth about faith and morals that the Catholic Church teaches, that's completely fine. Um, but if something in, your, in that theory denies something about the Catholic faith, um, then, then it's got to be false. Um, and so, so one theologian that I've read, he argues that, so um, one objection against evolution is that how do you get from something that Starts to, um, that, that isn't alive and then comes to be alive, right? Or how do you get from something that you can't see to something that can see? And you have these fancy explanations, but in the end, it's kind of like you're getting something from nothing. Um, you need to have some explanation as to how that comes to be. Well, one theologian <coughs> said, well, yeah, you can't just have um, dirt spontaneously come together to make, become a living thing, right? You need something there to fashion it and design it to become a moon thing. And he says, well, what, what is that? What could, be, what, could, what could have been there to fashion those things? And he says angels. Why not say angels were directing matter and guiding these generations of living things to develop the, the, the kind of organs necessary for seeing or um, all that. And, and, and maybe even they designed um, the generations of, of monkeys so that they got a body that was eventually suitable for a human soul. Um, and then at those moments when they got up to, to the right, right up to the, the point before the big leap, um, and they, they kind of prepared everything, then God came in and gave the new kind of soul, the human soul, and, and, and the, what was the leap before, or um, a, a soul, just a, any kind of a living soul into the dirt that was kind of designed. Um, so that the, the angels are kind of just helping it along the way, and then God gives the necessary aid 
um, when, when it comes next to when it comes to that. Just to clarify, um, part, um, we did not come from apes, or we do not believe that we evolved from apes. We got that clear, right? Yeah, I guess right. it would be yes. under okay. the other All right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and because we learned from our father, Alan talked about the theology of the body, we can be bringing our creations. Greatest creation is what? We talk about the body, right? So, so to clarify that. So, because we are what? We're not just animals. Remember that? We are hybrids. And that we make the difference, the father Alan talked about, like we have reason, we have mind, we can rationalize, animals can't, right? So we can think animals can evolve, plants can evolve, but human beings, the greatest creation of, from God himself, we are not, we are made by God to him. Yeah. yeah, we don't evolve from something. It's all from God's love and goodness that we exist. Every human soul is created directly by God. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we don't evolve from the ape, and that's why we don't believe human beings have evolution of life in us. We're not in that lower category of species of creation of things. Remember what Father Allen talked about? Does that make it clear? Okay, so there's a lot because the education system only talks about the science of faith as if it's separated, it's incongruent, it's not. Science is just because of yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that's well, the that's the general principle, right? That anything that contradicts the Catholic faith, you can't do that. Um, so if you say that we evolved in, from apes um, in such a way that that God didn't make us, then that's, that's false. Great. Thank you. Um, and I don't, I don't have a watch, so you can just okay. cut me off anytime you want. But I'm I'm I've got a free afternoon. So I can stay here all day. Well, David's got a lot of questions. Get this. So, if I know that someone is in the state of mortal sin and they don't intend to go to confession, could I murder them and then send them to hell and then later I go to confession and now I go to hell? Wow. Is that like a weird thing? Did you know that Shakespeare actually had that in one of his plays? No, I didn't know that. In Hamlet, um, a really, really evil man who says, he sends these two thugs to go kill someone. And he says, how do we commit a mortal sin and then kill them? That way they're insured to go to hell. It's like, um, It's really dark, Kyle. <laughs> but um, there's, a, there's a distinction that should be made. If you do it, intending to go to confession later on, then um, that's a sacrilege. Because if you go to confession, uh, or if it was always part of your plan to do this sin and then go to confession, when you go to confession, you're not actually sorry for that sin. Um, and if you're not actually sorry for your sins, then you can't be absolved from your sins. I was confused with my sacrilege. Oh, yeah, yeah. So a sacrilege is, um, I guess I would say, um, um, a perversion of, of some holy thing. Um, the, well, misusing the the intent of a good um, grace, yeah, that's good. right? Yeah. Misusing it, and then it's like our society now, they misinterpret for their own benefit, right? Yeah. If I may, it, it is sometimes we feel like, um, when you say, you live your life, well, I can live a bad life, all my life, and do all the things I want, the pleasure I want, I can be a player, I can have everything, fame, sex, wealth, all that stuff, right? But right before I die, I'm going to confess. Because <laughs> God is merciful, so I'm okay. Right? So that, that's like, that's like what you're saying, okay. you know, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you're actually testing God, and we don't want to test God. Another, another sacrilege that, um, I, it, I mean, it seems like it's actually happening a lot, is receiving Holy Communion in the state of sin before having gone to confession. Um, some of the priests have remarked, it's strange how long the lines are for Holy Communion at Mass, <coughs> but those, 
really short lines for confession. It's like, how, how does that work? Are all those people just immaculate if they have insanity? <laughs> um, that's very unlikely. Um, so, that would be another misuse yeah. of the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So, uh, we already talked about Father Ruth said, right, the sacrament of Holy Communion and Confession. We go to what Father Ruth said in one of his first lessons for the class room. You don't get anything from class if you only go to confession. This is why. Because you can't receive from the Lord in a state of sin. So, in order to be able to get the source of sacrament of praise, you really have to practice daily, regularly, the sacrament of reconciliation. Right? And you've got to believe in the true presence. Yeah. You just don't go up there and just say, la di da, we go up, we chew, we eat. And I, please don't ever be chewing gum and receiving uh. communion. Please don't, and if you see somebody, you know, family members that do that, just like, you know, let's, it's, it's a good thing to receive our Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, Father, that we ascend and, you know, we, you know, because we, right? And would it be, wait, when would it become a mortal sin? Because we know, and, and to be receiving our Lord not in a state of grace, is that a mortal sin? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're I mean, St. Paul says, if anyone eats or drinks without discerning the body, he eats or drinks judgment upon himself. Um, if you don't make an act of faith in, in the, the Holy Communion before you receive him, that's, that's very bad. It's very bad. And, and much worse than that is to actually commit a mortal sin and then go receive without, um, without having gone to confession beforehand. The reason why that's, all, why that's so bad is because when you receive communion, one of the effects of Holy Communion is you become more united to the church. And so when you receive communion, that you're telling everyone else you are already um, in connection with the church, and now you're becoming more connected. Um, but if you're in a state of sin, you're not actually connected to the church. So receiving Holy Communion is like a lie. It's, a, it's an action that's, that's, that's speaking something false. You're saying you are part of the church, but you're not actually part of the church. Or, sorry, you are, you're, you're in communion with, with Christ. You have the state of grace, but in, but in actual heaven, you don't have the state of grace. Because not to discourage you guys, okay? Yeah. But you gave him when you go to Sin to kill people in war? Um, definitely, if it's a just war and you're on the right side, um, which means you're defending a good cause, like defending your country, um, then it is not a sin. Um, other circumstances, like an unjust war, um, it, it gets, it's a gray area. Um, it might be bad, it might be good. Um, because even though the war in itself, the, even if the big whole war is wrong, at the same time, if you've got a soldier coming after you and he's about to kill your family, <coughs> um, that's still self-defense of your family. Um, so 
there's there's gray area. I don't know if there's a clean answer to that. Yeah. I think if you want, we can go over objects under the circumstance right now, just really briefly. Say for which ones? If you want to go over like objects under the circumstance right now, just oh. based for morality of action, because that has to do in the broader area of killing. Killing is like encompasses the rest. Yeah. Can. So okay, anytime. So so object um, and in circumstance. Um, what you do. Um, uh, let's see. What you do varies um, according to what you're acting on. Okay. Um, um, because you are using a pen and writing on a paper, right? Um, you're using those particular things. Um, that constitutes the action of writing. Um, if you are um, trying to think of an example that would be good. Um, okay. Yeah. If I'm, um, let's see. Okay, yeah. If I'm doing this, can you tell what I'm doing? Not quite, right? I might be holding a fan and fanning myself. I might be holding a fly swatter and just swatting myself. Um, the, the very thing you're acting on um, determines what you're doing. Um, is this kind of what you're thinking? I would say go into yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, um, circumstances can also determine what your, what kind of action you're performing. Um, so, um, Father Sebastian gave this example. Um, it's a good, it's good to change um, into different clothes every now and then, right? You, should, you shouldn't wear the same thing every day, unless you're, uh, unless you're um, <laughs> um, But, it's not good to change clothes in the church. <laughs> that was kind of um, but it is good to change clothes in the church if you're a priest and you're putting on your um, your, your chasuble, right? Depending on the circumstances of where you are, um, an action can be good or bad, right? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Um, Does the church decide? And so yeah, the, the given circumstances of the war will vary. How about, how about, uh, in, according to that, well, how, how do you uh, say, love your enemy? If, if you're killing him, right? Mm. That question, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, right, how can you, if there's a man coming and, he's, uh, and you need to kill him for just reason, right, for good reason, how is that loving him at the same time? Good question. Um, well, one thing that immediately comes to mind is um, if you prevent him from killing your family, you prevented him from committing a sin, mm -hmm. or committing a bad thing, right? Maybe it wasn't a sin, maybe it was. I don't know, it's hard to say what his intentions were. Um, but if you're preventing something that some evil um, that he was about to commit, then you just done a service for him, right? You, you kept him from committing a sin. Um, so in some way, you could even say that that was love loving him. Um, but you you have obligations to your family that um, take precedence to a stranger, right? You should love everyone, but you should love your mom more than you than you love you know the cashier at the, at the restaurant. Um, and so I would say in, the, in that circumstance. Um, you have a duty to protect, protect your family, even if that means um, causing some harm to a specific person. Does that, does that satisfy? Sort of? <laughs> it's like you do whatever you can in your power to protect your family and love the other person, right? But the church does teach, we, we would have to have like another class on this to discuss, but there's a hierarchy of obligations of like who you're obligated to, right? Who to protect in your duty. So like if your vocation as a parent, you have an obligation to your family, right? Your children. So that has to do with the circumstance. And the circumstance is you're in war, right? So as long as you're doing your best to protect your family and you're loving the other person as much as you can, maybe try to prevent them from killing your family while at the same time maybe restraining them instead of killing them. 
But if the last resort, and like I mean the last resort is that you have to take their life, then that's what you have to do. That's your duty. And in the end, we can't judge each other's actions, but God will know, right? God will judge our hearts. So we judge as that's where, judge hearts. Yeah, that's where your faith comes in. So just do everything that you can in your power. And that's all that God asks. Well, it's like um, when Flowers um, that we never, we see other children who are not adopted, poverty, it's, all, it's always with us, right? But now we, we give up all our money so that we can give it to that charity, but then there's nothing left for our children, our own family, right? So that would be an obligation that we have, our calling for the devil. So that comes in my, or, or in marriage, my actually, my duty is first and foremost responsible to my husband, not my children. <laughs> but yes, as you did, Mary, um, husband and wife, we must nurture that holy vocation first, and then it's our children. And so, some people might say, what? Right? And it's like, huh? And our society is kind of wrong because what happens is that we kind of try to do everything for our children, and then we undermine husband and wife, and that's where there's so many rifts. So it's kind of like that, you know? So, yeah, even though you have your, your spouse first, before you yeah. love, that doesn't mean you don't love your children. Yes, yeah, for sure, yeah. But you got a spouse, but a lot of times we forget the spouse and get the kids, and then that's where things come. Our duty is first and foremost to the spouse is first. Yeah, so. And then I know, Kyle, you have questions about crusades real quick. You want to ask about that? that kind of oh, yeah. Were the crusades justified? Um, I haven't specialized in studying the crusades, but I, I, I have heard before that the, at least the first crusade was very, uh, very much justified. Um, I think there's a question about the later ones. Um, and the, the reason that I've heard is um, we are a people of God. We're like a, the Christians are a nation um, that God has, has formed. Um, and it's good for a nation to fight for what is their own, right, in the name of God, and on, for the sake of furthering his kingdom um, and establishing it more firmly on earth. Um, and so their intentions in the First Crusade, as, as far as I understand, was to reclaim the Holy Lands um, so that they would be well respected um, and be given the due, the due um, you know, reverence that, that they deserve. Um, but I don't know, I'm not, yeah, I wouldn't say that I... I'll give you the website. I am yeah. the questions. I do recommend Kyle, and I'll do it on the Google Classroom. So the Google Classroom said, um, the Crusades, the first one being pulled, I remember that um, the, the Christians, Catholics are so bad because they kill people, um, and it, um, how dare you, and the narrative, remember Father Andrew said, the narrative about the rainbow now? Now it's a bad thing. Remember what Father said, all, almost every other class, God's way is always the opposite of the human secular way, right? So the children told that uh, God allows people to kill for his name, he's this narcissistic God, you know, this, and that's not it. It's the, again, it's like this. If someone would come right now to this monastery and start shooting at everybody and killing everybody, would we not all get together in fact, that happened, right? That is the truth. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Presbyterian Church. And, but that was the crusade. Remember, as I said, most of all the world was Christian. Remember, God was spread for everybody, the whole world. So if someone were to come, just imagine all the parishes here in Orange County. Now, let's say a hate group comes in, and then they get together and say, let's all let's shoot up and pillage, rape everybody in the end. Everything away from every single Catholic church in <coughs> here. Would we be okay just sitting here and going, oh, that's a good, just let them in, bring them in, who cares? You want something else, right? No, you would be fed by the Lord. The crusades is actually, it was the churches. The ones who came in and pillaged and took over and threatened and killed. So back then, remember, everybody was united under the church. Kingdoms were under the church. That's why the crusades were Christ, the word Christ, the cross on them. And so it gets to be, later in history, it gets to be twisted and turned, right? So 
So now with, with the kids are learning is that the church is so bad and so everyone so you gotta come out of these schools and everyone feels ashamed like, oh no, you know, and you know, we gotta respect every religion and uh, so that's again stacking up confirmation to give you the seven gifts so you know the truth. You understand the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, and the counsel. Well, counsel is doing what like right or wrong, mm-hmm. right? Piety feels the Lord. That's Does that make sense now? Okay. And I would add, um, confirmation, in confirmation, you become an adult of the church. And um, part of that is, be, is um, being prepared to defend the church. Um, and so this is kind of, you're being given <coughs> grace in the sacrament. Um, part of that grace is for the sake of being able to stand up for the church um, against these errors that are spreading. Right? 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 And that's, that's one of the important things about apologetics, right? You should, you should have some of the basic arguments um, kind of ready so that when people approach you about these things, um, you're prepared. Or you at least have some place you can go to and say, well, let me, let me check into this and I'll get back to you. Um, Any other questions? Do you have a question? Um, so I know that people is basically um, evangelical, but let's say like um, you could go to a house and not because of the passion, but because you said a really bad role model to your son or daughter. Okay, yeah, that was a good question. That was one of these. Um, there's, um, so first of all, once you are actually legitimately married, um, you cannot undo that. There's no undoing that marriage. Sorry, well, um, there, there, Two exceptions if you're not baptized. Um, but if, you're, if there are two baptized people um, and they get married, that marriage is permanent for the rest of their lives. Okay, so um, there's no there's no such thing as, as a divorce if by divorce you mean they're no longer married. Um, but the church does talk about um, separation, um, and the act it's actually in the Code of Canon Law. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, and it says there are two, two, um, two occasions when you're allowed to separate, which means you live apart from your, your spouse. Okay, this is, this is the okay, Canon 1153. A spouse who occasions grave danger of soul or body to the other, or to the children, or otherwise makes common life unduly difficult, provides the other spouse with a lawful reason to leave either by a decree of the local ordinary or if there's a danger and delay, even on his or her own, 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 um, her own authority. Um, so if you have if there's grave danger of soul or body, either to the spouse or to the children, um, or, or, or um, something else that makes common life unduly difficult, um, then there are grounds to, to, to um, become separate from that spouse. And it's a really important <coughs> And the church really does encourage you to try to make it work. Right? Um, maybe you maybe you go you separate for a time and then you work on reconciling that reconciling that situation so that you come back to having, having a whole family. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can be both. <laughs> that wife and that husband 
does not have the right, I'm going to put the word right, lack of better word, to go date other people and get remarried. That is the key. The church, God never put, say, keep people in danger. But just because they're civilly, legally on paper divorced because it has to, that's the reality we live in, both people are still valid in marriage. And that's why it's so important we talk about these issues. Guys and gals, you are dating the purpose of dating and what you will have for your vocation. It's not to love our passion and to make you happy. It's to find virtue to get that person. We look for someone to be married that will increase the virtue in your life to help you get to heaven. The passion and all of that, that's a secular way. That's when people get passion, I'm high and divorce, right? Again, just because you chose and you chose each other and you unfortunately both had more vices than virtue, well no, you're kind of stuck together. You're both baptized, well then that's why you pray you you meet a good person that is virtuous, right? If you find someone with more virtue, the chances of divorcing and having problems and you would be able to cipher it through, hopefully not end up marrying that person. For instance, somebody who has bad habits of drinking or gambling or even having more, um, mistresses left and right, you don't have the right to divorce. That's not grounds for, it's still a valid marriage if everything else is held. It's just unfortunate that your partner, your spouse, your husband, wife has lack of virtues. Lack of virtues is not grounds for annulment. And it's not, you still marriage to that person. That's why we always pray. I always say this goes my mom to encourage all of you. Pray for your future husband, pray for your future wife. Because you should start praying for them now. Make it God and your future state, Mother Mary, you know, allow you the chance to meet good people, a virtuous future person. I tell my kids all the time, right? So this is why I grew up to do this and talk a lot about it because if you don't have the domestic church strong, the big Catholic church is going to fall. The Catholic church relies on the domestic church. cheat on me, but when you, or until you gamble away, or, you know, it, it doesn't happen. I, I, I'm married to you until death do us part. Not the kind of death that you took to kill on me. It's kind of worrying should, me over there, that corner over there. That could be a point of, uh, that's a good point of the New Old Testament. Um, it looks like God allowed divorce. You know, you read that, that Moses allowed divorce, but wasn't really the case. Um, God, God gave a special permission because back then, um, unfortunately, the Israelites had an inclination to do that very thing. They knew they couldn't marry someone else unless their other spouse died. So sometimes they would actually go and kill their spouse so they could marry this other person, which is terrible. Never do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but because of the Kids don't justify the means, okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll keep it in mind. <laughs> yeah, keep it in mind. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it a sin to listen to music with bad lyrics? With what? With what? Um, bad lyrics. Yeah, with like bad lyrics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say so. I mean, um, it depends. I mean, are you listening to it for the sake of hearing those bad lyrics? If that's the case, then, <laughs> then yeah, it's not good. Um, if you happen to be listening to a song, and um, you didn't know there were bad lyrics in it, um, and you, you happen to hear it, um, then you know you're not culpable for that. Um, but I mean, if you had a original suspicion that this, they're going to be talking about sex in here, it's going to bring up bad images. No, no, I'm good. Can you think it could be an occasion thing? Think about it. Why are you listening to it? Everything you do to know and love, serve God. If you're listening to bad music, if you're playing bad video games, if you're looking at bad images. Is that knowing God? Is that loving Him? Is that serving Him? That's the first thing you should ask yourself. So if you know that it doesn't fall, it doesn't complete that, then 
then that probably you shouldn't be doing that, right? And again, if you say you just want to relax, there's so many other ways to relax the music, and there's an indication of sin, right? Because music will influence your thinking, your habits, and it goes to how you dress, too. Your decorum, right? Are you going to be an occasion of sin by what you're listening to, how your speech is, how you dress yourself, right? And you've got to think, am I, as Paul said, you are now going to be living the faith and people are going to see in you before you say anything. They can see if you are a Catholic or God's born and good Catholic. You don't have to go, the best way you can be preaching to your church medicine is actually not saying anything, but just living the faith as best as you can to please God. You can you can be a good Catholic and still look good. Yeah. We hope so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is, there, is it a sin to play shooting games with cartoon characters? Super <laughs> 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 Like if you're playing like a war game where you're going around and like shooting people. Um, Any game. Yeah, Call of Duty. Can I tackle this one? Yeah. Okay, in my case, once we know that I, I, I was in practice in my people, but we find is it a sin again? Why are you playing it? Always go to the why. Why are you playing it? Because I need to relax. If that be, if you like, if you're forced to be, that's the only way you may be. But I, I would say that, yeah, it would be because it would be an occasion for something else. And especially at your age, where you don't have the prudence, or you don't have the wisdom or experience yet. So you're playing, you're dabbling with an occasion of sin, where you're not armed to confront or go and defend against. Does that make sense, Kyle? Okay, right? So it's just like what we talked about, like the Ouija board and the Holy Ghost. You think it's all fun because it relaxes you or because all your friends are doing it, especially during Halloween and all. But you're dabbling into something that you're not ready for. And it, and again, what's the reason for doing it? It's just for fun. But that, yeah, that's an occasion of sin, right? So you find, and again, it does say you can't stop playing video games. That was an example. They do, um, my oldest said, they have to simulate killing and fighting war because he's serving in the Navy, right? Yeah. So you're, he's actually forced to do those things, right? But that wouldn't be simple on his part because he has to, right? But on your age, where you're like, again, why are you doing this? Always ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is the purpose? And does it fall into the category of knowing, love, and serve our Lord? If the answer to you is no to all three of that, then find something else and you know that it's just not right. Alright? And you can think about, right, that in today's culture there's so much murder, right? Like even of abortion, right? Where people don't value life. It's kind of strange for us Catholics, you know, to, to relax by 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 simulating killing people. Right? That's kind of if you brought that point, you can ask, so studies have shown children playing all more violent uh, games, more violent music. And what happens is, is there's, um, it's part of the brain that stimulates your brain. The frontal. You lose interest in it. There's been studies with the CT and MRIs to show the, um, the, the brainwave activity and its receptor center. The longer, the longer, the longer. And that's just how 